Good morning, church. Welcome to service on this 15th of November. I'm your music director, Kevin Nave, and I hope this morning finds you happy and healthy. Please join me in our opening hymn, number 273 from our hymnals, Jesus' Hands Were Kind Hands, verses 1 and 2. Good morning. I am Mike Robeson, our lay liturgist for this morning. Let's pray, asking our Creator to be present with us today. Gracious God, we thank you for your promise to be with us and among us today as we worship you in a spirit of humility and holiness. We invite you to be our true mirror, to hold up before us your word in such a way that we see our true selves. Help us also to see a new way, the fullness of your glory, grace, and mercy. We await in the next hour your word to us, that by it we may be empowered to live in the world, announcing your great love for all and for your rule of justice, reconciliation, and peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and friend, amen. Good morning, church. I'm Reverend Cora, and I want to welcome you to worship this morning. Everything that you need to participate in today's worship service can be found online at our website, waterfordcumc.org. There you'll find our order of worship, today's prayer list, message notes, and devotions, as well as our text for our scripture today. We send that out on Thursdays in an email, and so if you'd like to be included in that email list, you can contact our church office. Pastor Jack is going to be joining us by video for the sermon today as he is quarantining at home in an abundance of caution after a possible contact with COVID, but he is well. We also want to remember that today is June's last Sunday with us live, and uh, so please write your uh, notes below thanking her for her service here at Waterford Central. It's been such a joy to serve with you and have your music with us. Luckily, you've recorded um, some music for us, and so we'll have June continue to offer us music for a few weeks into the future. So thank you, June, and best of luck in your next, um, your next church that you're serving as an organist. I also want to invite you to be on the lookout for um, the ability to participate in our Advent by Candlelight um, series of events coming up in December. So usually in the past, we've had Advent by Kindlelight here in the sanctuary. That's an event that's made for women to prepare their hearts for Christmas. We've had some great speakers and sang good songs together. This year, we're trying to do that all digitally. You can either invite a group of friends together to join you on Zoom or Google Meet, whatever your favorite platform is. Um, we'll give you some videos to show and some discussion questions to engage in with your friends or family. Or you can join myself or Kathy Chow as we host some small groups through uh, early December. You can find that information on our website or in the newsletter that we will send out on Monday. Finally, I want to let you know with our school district um, Going back to virtual learning, there is not going to be any blessings in a backpack packing um, this week or um, for the near future until the students return to the school. So if that's something you're interested in participating in when students do return to school, I'd love you to contact me and I'll put you on that list for the future. 
Friends, at the end of service, please record your worship attendance with us. You can do that at the form um, that will be linked below in the comments section or by going to our website. You'll see it um, right at the top of the page. I'm back with our children's message, so if you have young ones to gather around, you can do that at this moment. Now, I recently saw this great video of a dog that had made a big mess of their owner's house. It, there was stuff all over, the pillow fluff flying and papers thrown about, and the dog was hiding in the corner, all scared, almost as if the dog knew it had done something wrong. Sometimes we know that we've done something wrong, too. We might mess up or steal or lie, and we can find ourselves wishing that we could curl up in a corner with a blanket over our head, just like the dog I saw in the video. But sometimes we can catch ourselves before we do something wrong and decide to do the right thing. That's what makes our human brains great is we have the ability to make a choice, to decide between doing something that we know is right and something that might be wrong. Sometimes we can make this choice without even realizing that we are uh, making sure to do the right thing. If we do those right things often enough, it's kind of like a muscle that we exercise. It becomes easier and easier to do what is right. In today's Bible story, we hear Jesus talk about how God can separate those who do good things and those who do harmful things. God rewards people who do good things, but not those who do harmful things. In our Douglas Talks video that I'll post later in the worship service called Choose to Do What's Right, we can learn more from Douglas about how we can do what's right and care for ourselves and everyone around us. But first, let's take a moment to pray. I'll start and you can repeat after me. Loving God, we are learning every day to choose what is right. Be in our heart, be in our mind, and in our hands that we might choose to do what is right every chance we get. Amen. We're going to move now into a time of prayer together. I have a few prayers that I'm aware of that I want to offer up to you all. The first is a prayer for sympathy for Brad and Shelley Nowak and family on the death of Bradley's father, Roy Edward Nowak. Secondly, we want to offer prayers for Beth Perry, who is awaiting a surgery on November 20th. And for Eric Stileski, the nephew of Carol Nelson, who currently has COVID. We currently certainly also want to remember all the people who uh, we are aware of or unaware of who are facing illness right now for those in our healthcare system and our essential workers who are helping to care for us and keep life as normal as is possible during this pandemic. And uh, I think we also want to just continue to pray that we can find ways to find joy this holiday season, even though it might look very different than in years past. Let's take a second to lift all these things up and the things that you are holding on your heart today in prayer. Will you pray with me? God, we know that you hear the concerns of our hearts, those that come quickly into words that we can share with others and those that just remain deep sighs, things that we can't put quite into words. We know that you know those prayers too and that you take them into your heart and offer us love and care and comfort. We pray that we might continue to be community to one another, 
to share that love and care and comfort to each other. God, we ask you to be with us when we mess up and when we fail to be your people. Help us to continue to turn to you each and every day to receive your grace and to make something new out of this life that we're living. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ who gave us these words to pray together, the Lord's Prayer, which we pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is from the prophet Ezekiel. Chapter 34, verses 11 through 16 and 20 through 24. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. They, there they shall lie, lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock. They will no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, and he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, that you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are a member of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, you are accursed. Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, Lord, 
When was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and we did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will be going away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, uh, we're going to have the message now, and if you want to take out your message notes, you can fill in the blanks, you can write in the uh, margins, uh, whatever is helpful to you. There's five days of devotional material that uh, is available to you to help unpack the scripture and the message uh, that I'm going to share with you now. Uh, there's also uh, five days of devotions uh, that are recorded uh, to help you further unpack uh, the message. So it's good to be with you. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The title of today's message is from a popular children's song, I Just Want to Be a Sheep, Ba 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 Ba. It's a, it's a song that proclaims, I just want to be a sheep, Ba 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 Ba. And that's the refrain uh, for the first verse. But then there's other refrains is that you don't want to be a goat. Nope. You don't want to be a goat. Nope. 
If you, if you had to be an animal during the biblical times, it would be preferable not to be a goat. For one reason, there's that whole scapegoat thing. You could read about that if you want to in Leviticus 16, chapters 21, or verses 21 and 22. The scapegoat was the goat over which the head of the high priest, Aaron, confessed the sins of the people of Israel on the Day of Atonement. Then that goat, symbolically carrying the, the, the sins of, of the people, was driven out into the wilderness where it probably became dinner for a, a hungry lion. Of course, one might argue being a sheep could be equally dangerous. A sheep, after giving up its wool, often appeared on the dinner table or in a stew or on the altar as a sacrifice. That said, goats in the Bible clearly are not viewed as sympathetically as sheep. And the New Testament singles out goats for unwelcome treatment as well. When talking about the final judgment, Jesus speaks of separating the sheep's and the goats, and it's clear that the goats are the losers in that sorting. For a shepherd, separating sheep and goats is not difficult, though both species are often pastured together uh, and can be similarly colored, they are easily distinguished from one another. Goats are thinner than sheep. They have different eating habits. Uh, goats browse on leaves and shrubs and twigs and vines, while sheep graze on uh, grass and clover. Goats are curious and independent by nature, while sheep prefer to stay put with the flock. Goats have hair, but sheep have fleece. And a goat's tail stands up, while a sheep's tail hangs down. <laughs> of course, Jesus isn't talking about animals at all. He's using sheep and goats as an analogy for humankind, which is likewise sorted into two groups, sheep people on the right and goat people on the left. And although Jesus is talking about barnyard animals, it's clear in this narrative that this narrative is about judgment that is final and eternal. The sheep people are told that they will inherit the kingdom prepared uh, for you from the foundation of the world. The goat people are cursed and will go into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. If, if ever there was a part of our faith that we would just as soon ignore and forget, it is that concept that we will one day be judged for our lives here on earth. That is, we would just as soon ignore and forget the concept of judgment unless we're quite sure we're uh, sheep people. <laughs> Don't judge me seems to be the, an indignant response to any hint of discretion. Pastor and author Lewis Smeads wrote in an article a long time ago, 20 years ago, uh, in Christianity Today magazine. He, he, he wrote, quote, I would suggest that in our day and age, we need more, not less judgment. Modern Americans suffer from a fear of judgment. Passing judgment on the behavior of fellow human beings is considered an act of medieval, undemocratic intolerance. But then he continues to write, common sense suggests that if no one ever judged other people, there would be no human or real human community. In a sinful world, no community can exist for long where nobody is ever held accountable. No teacher would grade a student's performance. No citizen would sit on a jury or call a, a failed leader to account. And when you do come to think of it, nobody would ever forgive anyone for wrongs he had done. We only forgive people for what we've blamed them. And we blame them only after we have judged them. I believe Smeads uh, has, has something to say about this that is, resonates with us. If you think about the words he uses, a lack of judgment leads to a lack of forgiveness, which indicates a lack of accountability that results in a lack of community. In my experience, when someone is defensive and, and advises, don't judge me, there's often a second part to that advice. Don't judge me. Can you hear the second part? Can you hear it in your mind? Don't judge me. You don't know me. <laughs> there it is. A lack of community. Because there's a lack of accountability. I would say you don't need to know someone to know that certain actions are not acceptable. I have to say this, this don't judge me attitude is so foreign to my experience having grown up, up on, a, on a farm that was equal distance to three small towns. If I did some, something questionable on Main Street of any of those towns, my parents would know about it by the time I traveled the five miles back to the farm. And that was before cell phones and you didn't need a Snapchat or Instagram pic to prove what I'd done. <laughs> the, what is truly needed for community 
to exist is judgment tempered with grace so that real forgiveness is possible. The listeners of Jesus' story of judgment would have been grabbed by those very first words, all nations will be gathered before him. Okay, they would say, rubbing their hands together in glee, this is that long-awaited moment. Now we're going to hear how those wicked goats, the Gentiles, will get theirs. And the story has a surprise ending, though, one that undoubtedly shakes everything they've come to believe about faith and ethnicity. Jesus was expanding the concept of the, of the identity of the chosen people, based not on heritage and bloodlines, but rather how we live our lives. First, neither of the sheep nor the goats are especially attentive. Both of them are equally clueless as to when exactly they saw the Lord, quote, hungry and thirsty or stranger or naked or imprisoned. Second, the distinguishing feature between the two sets of people is, is not ethnic identity, as Jesus' listeners would suppose. Neither sheep nor goats seem to know which group to which they belong to until the shepherd sorts them out. And once they find themselves milling around in that group, they haven't the slightest idea how they got there. So this isn't some old exclusivist story about God's chosen being destined for salvation while the Gentiles go into the eternal fire prepared by, for, prepared by the devil. Jesus is spinning an entirely new narrative. The distinguishing feature in this new tale is not who your parents were. This is about Jews. This isn't about Jews and Gentiles. Greeks or Romans, slaves and freedmen. It's not even about saints and sinners. It's about our behavior and where our hearts are in addressing the needs of others. It should be comforting to us that judgment isn't random or dependent on one's ethnicity. There I got it, didn't I? <laughs> People of all nations will be subject uh, to a judgment that encourages and supports community. It's no accident that the sheep are the ones who are selected to be on the right side and welcomed into the inheritance of the kingdom. Sheep are more communal than goats. The psalm reads, the Lord is my shepherd, not my, uh, not my goat herder. <laughs> we tend to flock together and find protection in numbers, and we, we need a shepherd. Earlier in Matthew, in fact, it's chapter 9, verse 36. We read about Jesus, quote, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I'd like to share three observations about God's judgment according to our reaction to human need. First, our help for others is in the simple things we can do for one another giving someone a drink or a meal, welcoming a stranger, cheering the sick, visiting the prisoner are things anyone can do. All too often we compare ourselves with the great feats of, of uh, great faithful people. I'm reminded of the young man that I saw at a youth conference one time. He was wearing a t-shirt that said, please God, don't let me be behind Mother Teresa on Judgment Day. <laughs> While we all can't minister to lepers in Calcutta, we can all do things that, that Jesus said makes for an eternal difference in our lives and in the lives of others. Second, our help for others should be uncalculating. Remember, both the sheep and the goats were clueless about helping the least of these. We don't perform acts of kindness as if we're stockpiling eternal merit. We do so because our hearts go out uh, to others in need. The help which wins the approval of God is that which is given for nothing but, the sake, but for the sake of helping. Third, we should appreciate the truth that help given to the least of these is help given to Jesus and help withheld from others is withheld from Jesus. There's a Russian proverb that I was recently reminded of. It says that the way to a parent's heart is through aid to that parent's child. God, our, our Heavenly Father, wants us to help his children. When we help God's children, then we can know the joy of helping Christ. I want to conclude with a story 
about a boy living in, in children's home, uh, in a children's home. Uh, for Grace at the dinner table, the superintendent would always pray, Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let this food to us be blessed. And after this happened several times, the boy said to him, You always ask Jesus to come, but he never does. Will he ever come? And the superintendent said, If we really want him to, he will. And the boy thought, I really want him to, so I'm going to put a chair beside me tonight, and he'll have a place to sit when he comes. That very evening, during supper, there was a knock at the door, and standing there was an old man, poorly clothed, cold, and hungry. And the superintendent uh, invited it in to join them, invited him in to join them for supper. And he pointed to the empty chair. And the man sat, and the boy gladly passed food to him and even shared from his own plate. Later, the boy said, Jesus must not have been able to come uh, himself. So he sent this man in his place. Exactly. Exactly. Our good deeds are not by themselves a means of salvation, but they do put us in a relationship with Jesus, whether we, we recognize it or not. I'm wondering, as we enter into the season of Advent in a couple of weeks, and the bells are, are going to begin ringing and appeals uh, are being received, one of them our own Christmas offering, will we see Christ in the face of those we are helping? While there are so many images of people, especially children in need, there are many appeals that, that use no such images. So think about this. Can you imagine the face of Christ in, in the help you offer this Advent season? Can you see in the eyes of Jesus? Can you see in the eyes of Jesus the eyes of those who are hungry and thirsty, naked and imprisoned? Can you hear from the mouth of those needy souls the voice of Jesus saying, Come, you that who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I pray that you do. And friends, that's the word of God. For the people of God today at Central United Methodist Church, I hope you found it helpful. It's offered in the name of our loving creator, redeemer, and sustainer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to receive an offering now. Central is a member-supported organization, so your tithes and offerings go to support the ongoing operations, missions, and ministries of our church. I want to thank the many of you that have sent in tithes and offerings. If you want to continue to give, you may send in your offerings to the church. The information on the screen will tell you how you may also give electronically or through texting. Again, thank you for your generosity. Let's enjoy this beautiful offertory June has prepared for us. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all you've provided us in these challenging days, and we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you transform these gifts into life-affirming and life-giving ministries which you have placed in our hands. Bless those who are blessed through giving and those who are blessed through receiving. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Even in our social distancing, we embrace the face of Jesus, imagining each face that we protect by taking our precautions. Our whole staff at Central Church is imagining your faces in our prayers this holiday season, this Sunday, and wishing you good health, great joy, and that you know the love of Jesus Christ in life-changing ways. Please raise your voices with me one more time for our closing hymn, number 384 in our hymnal, 
love divine, all loves excelling, verses 1 and 2. May God continue to watch over you as you come and go, keeping you safe from harm, this day and forevermore. In the name of our loving Creator, our Redeemer and our Sustainer. Amen.